In this video, I'm going to provide an overview of the famous Chateauneuf du Pape region in the Southern Rhone region of France, and then I'm going to identify and discuss six of my favorite producers from that region to buy year in and year out. These producers will include a mix of coveted collectibles and seller defenders, so there should be something for everyone. Chateauneuf du Pape is a fantastic region for wine collectors for at least a couple reasons. First, this region still offers incredible value. There's many of very high quality wines being produced at relatively affordable prices compared to other regions. Second, many of you don't like to wait or buy wines and then put them in your cellar for a number of years before enjoying them. And the great thing about Chateauneuf is that many of these wines, especially those that are dominant in Grenache, can be enjoyed on release, or you can also age them in your cellar and enjoy them with five to eight years or more of additional bottle age. And so it gives you tremendous flexibility. Chateauneuf du Pape is located near Avignon in the Southern Rhone region of France. It's a vast AOC with 3,000 hectares planted to vine. There's 13 different grapes that are permitted to be grown in this AOC, or 18 if you include the color variants for five of them. Many of the wines that are produced in this region are dominant Grenache red blends that also include a little bit of Syrah and Merved, and sometimes a small percentage of other varietals as well. Both red wines and white wines are permitted, but 90% of the wines that are produced in this region are red wines, and only about 10% are white. While most of the red wines produced in Chateauneuf du Pape are GSM blends, it is not required for the wines to be a blend, unlike some other regions in the Southern Rhone portion of France. And so producers can make a 100% single variety wine if they so choose. For example, Chateau Reyes makes a wine that's 100% Grenache. With respect to climate, the vintages have been getting warmer in Chateauneuf du Pape, and so the vintages have been fairly consistent. It's somewhat unusual for Chateauneuf to have a truly bad vintage. Historically, it was difficult for producers to get their grapes ripened, and in fact, there was even a minimum alcohol requirement. And so those vineyards that had Galet Roulé, or these stone pebbles that were located throughout the vineyards, were thought to be a very important factor. These pebbles helped to ensure ripeness for the grapes each year, because they would absorb heat during the day, and then radiate that heat back to the vines at night, which helped to ripen the grapes even at night when it was cooler. Now, however, heat is a bigger problem, and so these galet roulé are not as important as they were in years past. Another big factor in the vineyards is the mistral winds. These are very strong winds that can damage the grapes and reduce yields. One way that producers help to prevent damage from these strong winds is by training their vines to bush vines rather than using a trellis. By having bush vines that are close to the ground, they help to minimize some of the damage from the wind, and given the heat and the strong sun that is experienced in Chateauneuf du Pape, these bush vines also help to shield the grapes and protect them from sunburn. While it's difficult to generalize a description of a Chateauneuf du Pape wine due to the variations that can be achieved by the different blending components, it's not unusual for these wines to have a little bit lighter color and for them to be rich, bold wines that have a red fruit profile and which have so-called garigue descriptors. Garigue is the word that's used to describe some of the herbs that grow on the side of the road in this portion of France and that include things such as sage, thyme, lavender, and rosemary. And if they're a Grenache dominant blend, there can be a little bit lower acidity as Grenache is a low acid grape. Again, however, this will vary by blend and to the extent that the producer includes a higher percentage of Mourvedre and Syrah, certainly there could be a darker fruit profile and perhaps a bit more acidity than if it was a Grenache dominant blend. The first top producer of Chateauneuf de Pop that I'll be discussing is Clos de Pop. Clos de Pop is aptly named because a portion of its vineyards are located near the Pope's castle and surrounded by walls. Clos de Pop has around 40 hectares of vineyards that are spread out amongst 30 different parcels. These parcels have varying soil types, including clay and limestone. By blending the fruit that's produced from these varying soil types, Clodopop is able to achieve wines with complexity and depth. Clodopop makes both a red wine and a white wine. The red wine typically consists of a blend that includes 65% Grenache, 20% Mourved, 10% Syrah, and 5% of other permitted grapes. Interestingly, however, Clos de Pop is one of the very few producers that uses all permitted grape varieties in both their red wine and their white wine. 
Clotopop is an extremely consistent producer and one that I generally consider buying every vintage. Both the red wine and the white wine can be outstanding. The red wine can often be purchased for around $100 a bottle, whereas the white wine costs a little bit less, maybe $80 or so. One of the reasons that Clotopop is so consistent is that it prides itself on its very low yields. They typically produce only about one third to one half of the fruit that's permitted by the Chateauneuf de Pop regulations. In terms of best vintages to keep an eye out for, with Clotopop, it's a fairly consistent producer, so you don't really have to be too concerned with vintages. They really haven't had a so called off vintage since about 2014, and certainly the 2019 and 2020 vintages that you'll find in store shelves are both excellent so you can buy those with confidence. And the one thing that I'll say with respect to the off vintages for producers like Clodopop, and also some of the other producers I'll mention in this video, is that I found that I still end up buying many of those wines because they sell for much lower prices, and also because that just typically means that you can enjoy the wines when they're younger and you don't need to age them as long. This varies a little bit for Chateauneuf du Pop compared to my approach for most regions, because my general approach is to load up on strong vintages and ignore weak ones. But with Chateauneuf, I found that I sometimes enjoy the off vintage wines as well. Back in 1880, Albert Reynaud lost his hearing and had to shut down his notary public business. He instead founded Chateau Reyas and began making wine in Chateauneuf du Pas. The Reynaud family continues to own and operate Chateau Reyas to this day. Emmanuel Reynaud is the current owner and operator and Emmanuel took over for his uncle Jacques back in 1997. There was a bit of a learning curve, and Reyes was a bit substandard from 1998 until 2004, but since 2005, it's been firing on all cylinders. Reyes is one of the most coveted wines, not just in Chateauneuf du Pape, but in all the wine world. It makes some absolutely stunning wines, and wines that unfortunately have gotten pretty high up there in terms of price. Nevertheless, these are world-class wines, and wines that you'll definitely want to have on your bucket list if you haven't tried them yet. As with most world-class wines, it's the Reyes Vineyards that play a large role in its success. The Reyes Vineyards are only 12 hectares in size. 10 hectares are used to produce red wines, and 2 hectares are used to produce their white wine. The Reyes Vineyards are notable for three reasons, however. First, the soils are very poor and sandy. Second, the vineyard's surrounded by a forest with tall trees. And third, the vineyards have northeast exposure. These factors combine to result in a bit of a cooler microclimate for the Reyes vineyards than is experienced generally throughout the Chateauneuf du Pop region, which has gotten extremely warm lately. As a result, these cooler temperatures result in wines that are a little bit more silky and elegant, certainly than most Chateauneuf du Pop and also which has a little bit more acidity and freshness than most Chateauneuf du Pot. One of the reasons that Reyes is so difficult to locate is because they only produce about 12 to 1500 cases per year of their flagship red wine. The flagship red wine is 100% Grenache, and whenever I'm asked to describe Chateau Reyes, I always describe it as a high-end Grand Cru Burgundy, but with a little bit more spice and a little bite to it. It's definitely more comparable to a high-end Burgundy than it is to most Chateauneuf du Pape. It's just an absolutely special and unique wine, and definitely one that I highly recommend for your bucket list if you have not tried it. Reyes also produces a second wine that's called Reyes Pignon. They produce about 650 cases a year of this wine. This wine is also 100% Grenache. It comes mostly from either the younger vines or the vines that are located on the northernmost portion of the vineyard. Unfortunately, this wine has also crept up in price and is quite expensive now, but it's definitely more affordable and less expensive than the top wine. Reyes also produces a white wine, and they produce about 425 cases per year of that wine. This white wine is a blend of Clairet and Grenache Blanc. This is definitely one that I recommend trying if you're able to locate it. If you're looking to source some of the top vintages of Reyes, I would definitely recommend considering 2005, 2007, 2009, and 2015, 16, and 17. All of those are outstanding, but I wouldn't hesitate to buy any vintage of Rias if you can get your hands on it. It's just a truly unique and exceptional wine, and one that I highly recommend. For those who want to experience a little taste of Rias without spending a fortune, I highly recommend the Chateau des Tours wines. 
Chateau de Tours is a sister property that's owned by the Reynaud family. And while they don't make Chateau Neuf du Pape, they do make Southern Rhone wines that are exceptional in quality and relative bargains compared to the other Reyes wines. You can typically get the Chateau de Tours red wines, for example, for around $100 to $150. And so definitely keep an eye out for those as well. Having discussed the most coveted collectible wine and one of the most expensive in Chateau Neuf du Pape, I'm going to shift gears and talk about my favorite cellar defender from Chateau Neuf du Pape, and one that's extremely affordable, vintage after vintage. While the family that owns Domaine du Pagot has been in the wine business for hundreds of years, Domaine du Pagot itself was not established until 1987. At that time, it was formed to be a family estate winery. The Pagot wine that I buy most frequently is the Cuvée Reserve. This is an absolutely exceptional wine that's consistent year in and year out, and one that I typically buy regardless of vintage quality. This is a wine that can often be purchased for around $50 a bottle, sometimes less. It's a wine that I oftentimes buy from my favorite flash site, which is linked in the description below. The Cuvée Reserve is a blend that typically consists of about 80% Grenache, 6% Syrah, 4% Merved, and then the rest being made up of other permitted grapes. This is a wine that has 100% whole cluster fermentation, and which ages for two years in large oak casks. Pigot also has a slight variation on the Cuvée Reserve called Cuvée Lawrence. The Cuvée Lawrence is identical to the Cuvée Reserve, except that it undergoes four years of maturation in large oak casks rather than two. This additional maturation time makes this wine slightly more elegant, a little bit less fruit forward, and it has a little bit more of a complex or tertiary characteristic to it. While it's fun to taste Pagot wines when they're young, and I often do pop at least one of them upon receipt, I typically prefer them with at least five to eight years of age on them, sometimes a little bit more in stronger vintages like 2010. I recently opened a bottle of the 2009. It was showing extremely well. So far, some of my favorite vintages for Pagot include 2003, 2009 and 10, 2015 and 16, and 2018 and 2019. Those who want to experience the top wine produced by Pagot will want to keep an eye out for the Cuvée de Capo. This is a wine that's made only in exceptional vintages and in fact has only been made seven times to date. This wine is produced from 100-year-old vines, so certainly an exceptional wine and one to keep an eye out for if you're looking to try the best of Pagot. Those who enjoy white Chateauneuf du Pape may also want to consider one of the two Pagot white wines. They have a white wine that's a Cuvée Reserve equivalent of the red wine, and they also have a wine that's more like the Cuvée de Capo, and which is quite pricey and one that's very hard to locate. If you're interested in wine recommendations, wine collecting strategies, and learning more about wine, please do subscribe to my channel. I've been collecting wine for more than 15 years and also have a level four diploma from the WSET. So I have both formal certification as well as substantial practical knowledge from the School of Hard Knocks. Anytime I discuss Chateau Neuf du Pape, I always get some comments from people who don't like Grenache. Grenache can be a little bit polarizing and many people are always interested in recommendations for wines that have less Grenache and more of the other permitted varietals in the blend. If you're in that category, you'll definitely want to consider Chateau de Beaucastel. Beaucastel tends to emphasize Mourvedre in the blends, and at a minimum, typically has no more Grenache than they do Mourvedre. And so this is definitely a good choice for those of you who are not Grenache fans. The Mourvedre also tends to be a bit more dominant, and so even if it has an equal percentage of Mourvedre and Grenache, the Mourvedre tends to be more expressive in the blend. Beaucastel is a historic producer that traces its roots way back to the 1600s. In the 1600s, it was founded by Pierre de Beaucastel. In the early 1900s, Beaucastel was acquired by the Perrin family, which has owned and operated it ever since. Today, the fifth generation of the Perrin family is in charge and is some of the most highly respected winemakers in the entire world. The Perrin family has been extremely innovative over the years. In fact, they began organic farming way back in 1950, and started farming biodynamically way back in 1974, way before either of those farming methods were in vogue. Beaucastel's flagship wine is the Chateau Neuf du Pape Rouge. The 2020 vintage is the one that's currently in shelves and is an exceptional vintage, as was 2019. So you'll definitely want to consider both of those if you can find them. 
As mentioned, this wine is equal parts Mouved and Grenache, with about 30% of each. It also has about 10% Syrah, with the rest being other permitted grapes. The Mouved is kind of dominant in this wine, and so you'll get some meaty notes, and definitely more of a dark fruit profile. And so if you're a little bit averse to Grenache, you definitely want to give this one a try. In terms of price, I did some checking, and it looks like you can get half bottles for about $40 to $50 in the United States, and full standard bottles will cost right around $100 or so. If 30% Grenache is still too much for you, or if you're interested in finding the ultimate expression of Beaucastel, then you'll definitely want to consider the homage Jacques Perrin. This is a limited edition wine that's made only on top vintages and which was first produced in 1989. This wine tends to cost more than $300 a bottle, and so it is kind of a coveted, expensive collector's item. Nevertheless, it is made from 75% Mourved from some old vines, with the rest being made up of Syrah, Grenache, and other permitted varieties. This one has more of a black fruit profile and is a truly special wine, so definitely one you want to consider if you're a Beaucastel fan. Beaucastel also makes a Chateauneuf de Pape Blanc. This wine tends to be Roussan dominant. The 2020 vintage, for example, was 80% Roussan. This is a wine that's highly regarded by critics year in and year out. This one sells for a little bit less than the red wine, so you can oftentimes find it for around $90 to $95 or so. With respect to my favorite vintages, certainly in recent years, the 2019 and the 2020 vintages are both quite strong, so you can't go wrong with either of those vintages, and those are the ones that you're likely to find predominantly available in the marketplace today. Domaine de la Genasse is a relatively recent winery by European standards, but it's one that I visited a few years ago and I've been a fan of ever since. It was founded back in 1973. At that time, they had only around 15 hectares of vineyards, but it's since expanded to about 90 hectares. These 90 hectares of vines are spread out over 60 parcels, but only about 18 hectares of the vines are located in chateauneuf du pape There's three different Genasse wines that I'll be discussing in this video. They range in price from around $60 to $100 or more, but all offer exceptional quality at their price points. The Domaine de la Genasse Chateauneuf de Pape tradition is their flagship wine. This one is readily available and it offers the lowest price point, right around $50 to $60 or so most vintages. This is a traditional blend that's dominant in Grenache with about 65% Grenache, 20% Syrah, 10% Merved, and the rest being other permitted varietals. 2020 is the current release of this wine, and it's an excellent wine, as was the 2019 before it. This wine is always an excellent value, and it's one that I look for most vintages. Another wine that I really like from Genasse is the Chopin. The Chopin is produced from 100-year-old vines, and it's 100% Grenache. As 100% Grenache, it's a little bit lighter and more elegant than some of the wines that are produced by Genasse. This one costs about $70 to $80, but is definitely an excellent expression of Chateauneuf and one that I enjoy most vintages. A few months ago, I tried the 09 Chopin, and it was showing extremely well, so definitely one that you can age a bit as well, despite the fact that it's 100% Grenache. My favorite vintage of Chopin is probably the 2016. This one's absolutely stunning, and definitely one worth seeking out if you can track one down. The third Genasse wine that I really enjoy is their Old Vines bottling. The fruit for this special wine comes from a small six hectare vineyard and some of the oldest vines that are owned by Genasse. This wine is a traditional Grenache dominant blend, but it includes 20% Mourved and only 10% Syrah. And so this is a higher percentage of Mourved than some of the other Genasse wines, and so it has more of a dark fruit profile. So those who prefer that style will definitely want to keep an eye out for the old vines bottling. If you're a big fan of Rhone wines like I am, and you want to know more about Northern Rhone wines, be sure to check out my comparable video on Northern Rhone wines that's in the pinned comment below.